This was my hometown and my father's town before me. It's a quiet place, a few stores, a restaurant, three, maybe four hundred people, hard workers, most of them. On the main street, the old men sit on the porch of the hotel in the sunshine, and they talk about the old days, the good old days. The park is always full of kids. After a rain, there are always plenty of puddles to sail boats in. But I must tell you that this town where I spent my childhood isn't really like any other town in the world. This is Dawson City, the center of the Klondike Gold Rush. History will never see its like again. Every summer, when the seeds of fireweed drifted across the valley of the Yukon River, we kids used to roam through these decaying buildings. Some of them had been locked and barred for almost half a century. You could buy anything in Dawson City in its heyday, I remember my father telling me. Anything from oysters to opera glasses. You could buy a dance hall queen for her weight in gold, and one man did. His name was Chris Johansson, and he lived on Whiskey Hill. For a child, Dawson was a bit like a giant play yard full of enormous dolls' houses, each one crammed with the trinkets of the stampede. Hundreds of picks and shovels, old magazines, bedsteads, pictures, furniture, bric-a-brac. We used to play locomotive engineer on the old Bonanza Creek Railway, almost in the very spot where George Washington Carmack picked up the nugget that started it all. We played steamboat captain too. These deserted stern wheelers were part of a fleet of, oh, there'd be 250 that steamed up the Yukon in the stampede days. Floating palaces brightly painted, loaded with champagne and dancing girls, and gold. Today, there isn't a single one left on the river. Most of the men are gone with the steamboats. Of the tens of thousands who came here, only a handful found the gold they were seeking. And yet, very few, I think, regretted the journey to Dawson City, for the great stampede was the high point of their life. The winter of 1897, beyond mountains 2,000 miles north from civilization, the cry was gold. All over the world, a million people laid plans to go. A hundred thousand actually set out. But the going was so hard, the way so weary that more than half turned back. My father was one of those who struggled on. Scarcely any of these men were miners. Most were white collar workers. My father had just graduated from university in civil engineering. All of them had one idea. They were on their way to the Klondike to shovel up gold. And they were going to be rich beyond the dreams of avarice.
the Chilkoot Pass. This scene, above all others, remained in my father's mind to his dying day. Even when his memory began to fail, this spectacle remained. You gotta pack a ton of goods up this terrible 45 degree slope of sheer ice. 100 pounds at a time, over and over again, a year's outfit. Without that, the Mounties wouldn't let you enter the Yukon. You couldn't stop to rest, or it might be hours before they'd let you back into that endless human chain. At the top, a city of provisions. 70 feet of snow fell that winter, and by spring there were seven such cities, layer upon layer, buried beneath it. But the persistent ones dug out their supplies and sledded off down the mountain slopes on the next lap of the great adventure. Here on Lake Bennett, at the head of the Yukon River, 20,000 men built 7,000 homemade boats. Few of them had ever handled a saw or hammer before. They cut the planks by hand, and then they used oakum to caulk the seams, or pitch, boiled out from spruce gum. Sometimes they even used their own underwear. And then the word, the river's clear of ice. And on June 3rd, 1898, the fantastic armada was launched. The mountains behind, Dawson ahead, 500 miles to the north. Clear sailing all the way downriver to the gold fields. Most of them were too late. They found almost everything staked, valleys, hills, even moose pastures. Here was El Dorado Creek, the richest of all, 31 claims, each worth more than a million, but all owned by men who'd been on hand 18 months before. All the land was being torn up by these early birds as they worked feverishly with sluice box and rocker. For the newcomers, nothing. Only a few got claims and these soon came to realize that you just couldn't scoop up the gold by the shovelful. You had to burn your way down through the permafrost, 30, 40, perhaps 100 feet. As you went, you kept testing for that elusive, glittering ribbon of soil known as the pay streak. It might take 10 months of back-breaking toil before you knew how rich you were. was there, and Dawson City grew on it. Here on a wedge of frozen swamp, not far from the Arctic Circle, a weird and exotic city sprang up, a city big enough to hold 30,000 souls. For one demented summer, it was Mecca. Here, too, ground of another kind was being staked out by the early birds, who would never need to swing a pick handle to fill their pockets. Forty thousand customers poured into the waiting town from all over the world. 
Australia, Greece, every province in Canada, every state in the Union. They had names like Calamity Jane, Diamond Tooth Gertie, Swiftwater Bill, and the Evaporated Kid. And if a man were shrewd enough or cold-blooded enough, a fortune could be made in a week. There were no price ceilings. A fresh egg cost two dollars, a glass of milk five, a pint of champagne thirty. For Dawson was feeding on gold. in from the creeks on mules' backs while the whole town watched. Watched and waited. My father used to talk about Big Alec MacDonald who had 29 mules, each loaded with 100 pounds of gold. He'd been broke two years before until he bought a million dollar claim for a sack of flour and a side of bacon. He lived to eat off gold plate and ride a carriage down the Champs-Élysées. But when he died back here in the Klondike, he was broke again. That was the way it went, down the hatch. You could buy wine enough to fill a bathtub. And if you were so inclined, and somewhere, you could pay a girl to take a bath in it. You could do anything if you had enough gold. alley ran right behind the main street. Every residence had a name on the door. Names like Montreal Marie, Spanish Jeanette, Golden Gut Flossie. For these ladies, Dawson imported fashions from Paris. Nothing but the best. With all its gaudy glitter, Dawson was never a lawless town. The Mounties saw to that. They might overlook the sins of the flesh, but they didn't sanction anything else. Nobody could pack a gun, and all the saloons had to close on Sunday. The Sabbath was so holy that one man was actually fined for chopping his own wood on the Lord's Day. You know, it's almost inconceivable that the law should have been maintained so firmly in a city nourished by that metal which is said to be at the root of all evil. And yet, in that crazy summer, no major theft, not a single murder. All the more remarkable because there were other passions to keep in check, national passions. Dawson was an American town on Canadian soil, subject to the Queen's laws, but populated almost entirely by strangers from the United States. And so the great festive day was a combination of Dominion Day and the 4th of July. It was a perfect moment for a celebration. The last stragglers had attained their Mecca, the miners in the creeks had finished their winter's work. The carnival had reached its climax. The daylight hours were endless. There was plenty of dynamite to explode and release pent-up emotions. The reverberations were so great that the very dogs fled the town.
were they celebrating, really? More than Independence Day, I think. More than Dominion Day. Each man had a great deal to think about. All were at least 2,000 miles from home. Some were 10,000. On the face of it, they had very little to celebrate. Only a few had got any gold, and very few of these were able to hang on to it. And yet, after the long months and the passes and the lakes and the rivers, they found themselves seized by a curious mixture of feelings, not the least of which was a strange elation. It's hard to believe, but after coming all this way, many of them never bothered to look for gold at all. It was as if somehow they'd already found what they were seeking. You know, when we were playing house in Dawson, it never occurred to us that any of this meant anything. That uh, one of these chairs, for instance, might be the very one in which Silent Sam Bonifield was sitting the night he lost the M&N Hotel in a poker game. It never occurred to us that each Victorian picture told its own story, that these two paintings had once been worth more than gold itself to a man who traded half his claim for them. No ghosts of the past returned to haunt us here in these silent rooms. I don't suppose the next generation gives the old days much of a thought either. For the Klondike is only a beginning to them, and not an end, as it was to the men of 1898. I think my father understood that. He found no gold, but he lived here 40 years, and I know he would have been content to die here, like some of his cronies. but that was not to be. He knew that each of us had his own Chilkoot to conquer of another kind. And so we left Dawson City behind and I don't imagine that I shall ever see it again. I don't suppose things have changed greatly. I know that old men still sit in the sunlight on the main street and talk of the good old days. And the good times, the times that are remembered, usually turn out to be the hardest times. Not the moment when the nugget was found in the pan, but those bitter hours in the passes and the long days in the trail. was something like a war. It caused many casualties. But those who survived it and learned from it were strangely ennobled. These men found their El Dorado. Well, 
That's my hometown, Dawson City.